Hallelujah. Uh, turn with me to John. It's not here today, but John 14. There are, there are messages that I preach. I, again, I don't ever believe there's a message I preach that's not important. I don't, I, I, I don't take my position and my job up here flippantly where I just like, you know, like, <laughs> good enough for today, you know. Um, it, that's why sometimes uh, it's always been, you know, I, I'll sit there and I'll, I'll be, I'll be, uh, especially when I preached on Sunday nights a lot of times because I focus so much on Sunday mornings and then Sunday nights go and I'm going, Lord, what do you want me to preach? Because like I've given all the good stuff today and I'm just, I, I, and, and, and cause I take it very seriously that I don't want to waste time up here. And, um, but with that said, this is a message that the Holy Spirit, the, the series that we're on here for the next couple of weeks is, is a message that the Holy Spirit started working in me at the beginning of the summer. Uh, of course, we were on a series with David uh, on David at that point. Um, but uh, but he started working in me and just little by little investing in me. And, and John chapter 14 was where he really started uh, feeding me on this. Matter of fact, it's the first scripture I wrote down. Um, but I believe, and I'm going to give you a great illustration of this in a second, but I believe if the church will get this, and I'm not talking about just us, but yes, us, if the church will get this piece of information and start walking in this piece of information, we will look different than we've looked ever in creation. Uh, your lack of understanding of who you are and what God created you to be is is holding most people back. Um, yeah, let's let's do this in order. Uh, so let's go to John fourteen verse twelve and let's 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 get this going. Um, <clears throat> this is verily verily. Now again in the in Scripture. In the Bible, if thing, something is mentioned once. It's important because it's God breathed. But if anything is double mentioned, uh, then it's not just important. It is uh, drop everything and listen to what I'm ready to say. So when he says verily, verily, when there's a double verily on something, it is literally him saying, listen to me, folks, drop everything that you're working on right now and get a hold of this piece of information. It doesn't double it. It uh, multiplies it exceedingly. You follow me on that? And so when he says verily once, it's Jesus speaking, so we need to listen. But when he says verily, verily, it means dudes, listen up, because your life will be changed if you get this piece of information. And so he says verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. Now again, the church world isn't grabbing a hold of this. We have set, and listen, listen to the whole thing, okay? Don't bail on me just because you don't like the first thing I say. We have set Jesus so far above us. That, it, it, that, that we have looked at it as a target not to attain, but just simply someone, just, and listen. I t- did I just tell you to listen to the whole thing? Okay, so. But not as a, a, a target to obtain, but just something to worship. Now, he is someone to worship. I'm not arguing that. But he himself said that the works that I do, you'll do, And greater works than these will you do. So Jesus on this earth did not just operate as someone that is so far above us that we can't even hope to attain. He said, no, I'm going to show you what you can do. Now, if we go over to Ephesians chapter 4, go ahead and flip there. uh, You can turn there if you want, but uh, Taylor, just show them real quick. Uh, Verse 13 It tells us the reason apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers have been given to us, verse 11, is so, and notice that last week, until we all come into the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man. Now, I know some of y'all think you're perfect. But what what is the biblical definition of perfect? 
unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he says, I'm giving you the fivefold ministry offices to invest into you, to equip you, to empower you, to give you insight, wisdom, and understanding so that you can mature into the people that you're supposed to be. And what people is that? A person that is in the full, that is in, measures themselves to the fullness of the stature of Christ. So you're not walking around just trying to be like Sue, Susie. I had to quit using that name because now I know a Susie. Uh, like you're, you're, you're not, uh, you know, Mrs. Smith or Mr. Jones. You're not trying to attain their ability because, again, that's where pride moves in or that's where uh, uh, shame has its day. Oh, Shandar Amaka. When you're trying to follow and try, if, if my objective is to try to be as good as Pastor Elisa, there are days that I could be pretty prideful and go, bam. I brushed her under the chair how good I've been. <laughs> not very often. There can be other times where I'm sitting there going, I'm not, I'm not worthy. I'm nothing. You know, I, I can't. I, I, she's so much better than I am. And then we walk around like dogs with tails tucked between our legs, not operating the way God wants us to be. And God says, no, here, this is the thing, is that if you will put the word of God to work, Pastor Mike and I were talking about this last night. If you'll put the Word of God to work and let the Word of God and the Spirit of God work in your life, the Spirit of God will automatically begin, begin adjusting you and, and, and refining you and, and creating you and making you more into the image of Christ than you've ever been. And it's not going to come because you tried hard enough. Yeah, that, just, that just freaks some people out. What do you mean because I try, don't we have to try? Listen, I, we said it in worship. Rest. Let the Spirit of God work in you. Get in the Word of God. Romans chapter 7 says, The good that I want to do, I don't do. Why? Because I'm working really hard in my flesh to accomplish something that it was never intended to manifest because I worked really hard in my flesh to do it. When I give up on trying and I just rely on what the Word of God says and the Spirit of God and let Him encourage me, let Him lift me up, now I begin doing things that I never knew I could do. Hallelujah. And so, so again, Jesus, and I'm not going to, we talked about this last week, laid down His Godhead. He was all God. But he laid it down to operate on this earth as, as a man. Which makes him the image that we're striving for. To do what he did. Now again, this message could end in a love of self. We could go into love. We could go in condom, you know, no condemnation. We're not condemning people. I mean, we could do a lot of things in this series. But the thing that jumped out on the, uh, uh, as soon as I wrote this scripture down, it was like Jesus, and, and again, we read this last week, so I'm not going to, you don't have to turn there. But it says in Matthew, for he taught as one that had authority. In Luke, it says, and they were all amazed and smoke, spoke among them saying, spoke among themselves saying, what a word is this? And, and for, for with authority and power, he commanded unclean spirits to come out, and they came out. Matthew chapter 8 said, uh, the men marveled, what manner of man is this, that, that even the waves and the, and the winds obey him? He operated, the main thing that he did on this earth was he operated in the authority of Almighty God. When he spoke, things happened. He may have touched people. But most of what he did was through the spoken word. And if he touched somebody, he also spoke. And beloved, if we want to do the works that he did and greater, we're going to have to get insight and revelation on the authority that we have through him.
Amen? Jesus walked in authority. He demonstrated authority over sickness, over weather, over demonic activities. And again, we talked last week about how it was given to us. Now, I want to spend just a few moments here. Uh, I, I close, I think I said it towards the end of my message last week, and so I want to show you some things real quick here uh, that I'm still trying to grab a hold of full revelation on it, if you'll, if you'll stick with me on this. But, but if you think about Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus taught them how to pray, um, my thought pattern was the first thing is that how many people, again, without thinking about it, if I were to ask you how many questions Jesus told us to ask God, how many things that he told us to ask God for in the, in the prayer, you know, the Lord's Prayer, most of us would say, well, a couple. But if you'll look at that, there's not one question in there. There's just declarations. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Don't, didn't say, would you please give us this day. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. This is not, that prayer is not based on, will you please? It's placed on, it's, it's, it's on you understanding who you are and you going before him. And, and, and again, I'm going to say it this way but making a demand on what's yours. He said, if you confess with your mouth that he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So you don't need to come to him and say, Lord, would you please forgive me? You just need to confess your sins. Keep your heart clean. Uh, you don't, are you following me? This, I know this is kind of, woo, but, but here's where this started coming from is let's, okay, let, let, we're going to go, we're going to teach this. There are three words in the, in the New Testament that are translated uh, ask, to ask. Uh, again, one of the first things, I was just sharing that with Jessica. I was sharing that part about the Lord's Prayer. And she said, well, what about you have not because you ask not? Of course we've got to ask. Well, I, I looked that up, and I kind of I, I inserted it. So we got to figure out the three words that have to do with ask. Now, this word, Taylor, I want you to come in. I went ahead and uh, created this, put that first slide up there, because here's the main word in, in the New Testament that is translated. All I did was copy the, you know, copied and pasted uh, from the Strong's, is translated ask in Scripture. Matter of fact, Scripture's like, James chapter 1, where it says, let, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And then it says, uh, 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 how does that, how is that worded? Uh, the next verse says, not asking. That's why I like dots. James uh, 1 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not, and, is, and it shall be given to him, but let him ask in faith. So ask is in, in two things. That, this word ask is the word that Jesus uses all the time to talk about his father and asking. And it's the word called, uh, uh, defined, ateo. Ateo. Aiteo is what it says there in the... But, he, but here's the basic definition of it in, in the Strong's, which again, Strong's isn't, just stick with me on this, because at first it says, to ask, beg, call for, crave, desire, require. Now, require is, is pretty much any place else, if you look uh, on the description of, of gr the Greek word 154, which is ateo, um, it'll say to ask, re uh, re uh, to ask, request, or demand. Demand is a much better word. Well, you could read that and you could go, uh, well, okay, so that's to ask God. Well, let's go to the next slide. Because, well, first, pause. See the G4441? It tells us, and the Strong's compare it to that. So let's go to G4441. A lot more information there. 
And I'm not going to try to say this word, but notice right here the bold statement I have here because it says compare here. And so we're going to compare and right there where it says and from G154, which is a teo. So in other words, he's saying, he's saying, look, this word means this, this word means this, this word means this. And G154, a teo, which is strictly a, dem- strictly, what, you know what strictly means, right? Don't let, don't let you get by with anything else, right? So it's strictly a demand for something due. So where other versions of ask had to do with like request as a favor or uh, we'll look at, I think this one, an urgent need or no, we won't look at that one. That one's uh, maybe in a little while, Uh, but 154, Ateo, which is the main one that is used, means to demand something that is due. Go back there to the, to the, the actual definition. So, I, I was talking with Jessica last night about this. She gets a, she gets a head start on some of the things. Um, but if you think about, uh, well, then why would they have ask or request in there? Okay, how many, how many have ever needed to get money out? of your bank account and you went into the bank and you took a withdrawal slip and you drew your account on account number on there, your name, you signed it, you put how much you wanted, you went up there. Right? Right. Now, now whose money is that? That's in that bank. Yeah. If you put it in there, the first, if it's a little note on it that says I've got a gun, then it's not yours. But if it's your account number, all that kind of stuff and you slide it to them, it's your money in there. You have full rights to that money. You, you, you have, it's due you because you worked on it, you put it in there, and it's due to you, but you still got to make a request on it. And so that slip is a request. It's not a question. It's not, now, now again, I've told you about this when I was in college, and I think some of you were there too, uh, where you made a, you put your ATM card in there, and we're like, man, I hope I have $20 in there. I hope that have you ever done that? I hope that check didn't clear yet, so I can get that twenty dollars out, and I'll deal with the overdraft in a little while. But I hope it didn't go through, so I can get that twenty. That's not very. That, that's where most Christians live their lives. They don't know if it's theirs or not. They don't know if they have it or not. But we'll ask, Lord, will you please heal me? Lord, will you please help me in this situation? Lord, will you please give me wisdom? When in when in According to Scripture, uh, James says, if any of you lack wisdom, put a demand on it. We're not ordering God around, but we're putting a demand on something that he said is ours. Remember last week when I gave that tissue box to uh, Pastor Elisa? She didn't have to ask me for tissues ever ever again until that was empty. Because if she wants something, she just puts a demand on it by pulling it out. I mean, if she wants me to come pick up that tissue box, Pastor Lisa, if, if she's going, will you give me a tissue? I'm going to look at her and say, listen, lady. Yeah, mucho cuckoo. I, I love you and all. Yeah, we're partners in this thing. And if you really need me to, you know I will. But use your other hand. You do it. I've already given it to you. You have full access to it. She doesn't have to get me to come and do something for her when, he, when, she, when I've already given her access to all the tissues she needs as long as it's in the box. Right? So you don't need to say, you don't need to go to God and say, Lord, I just really need wisdom. And I don't, I, you know, please, 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 I beg you, I beg you, will you, will you please give me wisdom? No, Lord, I know you have the wisdom. And I know you have the wisdom I need. And I just want, I, 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 I make a demand on that wisdom. How about, how about scriptures like James 4, 2, that you have not because you ask not? Again, I, I've, I've worked that because, again, what it says is that. But it has, it's a, uh, so you're thinking, okay, I need to ask God for stuff. But the, the, the literal is you have not because you ateo not. Because you're not putting a demand on it. You're not telling sickness to go. You're not. All right. I'll get into that. 
See, well, I told sickness to go and didn't go. Well, we talked about that last week, remember? Aren't, aren't we grateful that every word we speak that spoke this week didn't come to pass? Right? Uh, so so we're, we're, we, you've got to develop that authority. All right. But you have not because you, I tell you not, you're not putting a demand on it. Uh, an, another one that, um, how about ask, seek, knock? Remember that? Ask and, uh, ask and uh, it, it, you shall be whatever. All right. My brain just, uh, but it's that ask, word ask is demand. Put a demand on it and it'll be given unto you. Are you with me here? You see that? Put a demand on it. And it's not that we're demanding God. Most of it is we're demanding the, we're, we're commanding the enemy to leave, the, leave the premises. But there's sometimes that we need to go to him with confidence. We can boldly come before the throne of grace, Right? And so we boldly come before him and we just put a demand on what he's already promised us. And it doesn't mean I'm not being mean to the banker when I go in and I want them to cash a check or I want them to deposit a check or I want them to get some withdrawal. I'm not being mean. I'm not. I'm, I could be. I mean, maybe I was. But, uh, but I'm, I, I'm literally all I'm doing is putting a demand on what is rightfully mine. And most bankers know that. I mean, Sherry doesn't sit there at her, at her window and, and somebody puts a deposit check across there and she's going, push the button, push the button. They're robbing the bank. Stress, stress, anxiety. No, she's just simply, okay, they're putting a demand on what I have access. You know, you follow me on that. All right. So let me give you the other two words because I want you to see this, that these are two other words that mean, uh, uh, that, uh, are, uh, that mean ask. And they legitimately mean ask. Go to that third slide there. Um, ep eritawo. It's like I spoke the language all my life, isn't it? But it simply means to ask for, to inquire, to seek, demand. Demand is kind of a weak word there because this one only means this is this is the word what this is what Pilate did before Jesus uh, when he was questioning him. He was, just, he was just asking questions, getting information. Never one time is this used in the epistles or in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in reference to discussing anything with God, ever. Matter of fact, the main usage of this word is from the uh, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees in trying to trap Jesus or trying to just ask questions that really didn't have any answers to. And so this is not what we're... And the next one is actually the root word, uh, is the root of that pre- previous word, and it means to interrogate, to ask, beseech, desire, entreat. So it's an ask for a favor, basically. And, and so, so both of those are, they're all we mean ask, but there's only one that defines what we need to be doing when we're requesting things, or when we're, when we're talking to God. We need to know who we are, beloved. When we, how many, did anybody know I went to the beach a couple weeks ago with my wife? I didn't know if anybody knew that. We're on our way down there. And, and our favorite place to go is down to uh, Indian, Shore, Indian Shores, Indian Rocks, uh, just south of Clearwater. It's, um, it's just, it's wonderful. But it's further away and you have to go through Atlanta get, to get there. And so I'm willing to go to... Um, the trailer park in the worst part of, you know, in the holler does not have to go through Atlanta. I just, I don't like driving through Atlanta. But we wanted to go back to Indian Shores this year, so we went back to Indian Shores this year. And um, we, met, we had to go through Atlanta. So we get up early on Saturday morning. We're driving down there, and I just said this prayer. I said, Lord, I, I, I don't want to deal with traffic. Please open up the way for us. And so for the most part, we're, we're doing pretty good. The kids are a little bit behind us as we're going through Atlanta. Allison's driving them because all the boys bailed on her uh, in, going through Atlanta. And I'm driving through, and we're little, about, about three miles ahead of them. And we're doing pretty good. I mean, there was a lot of traffic, but we was moving, which is a blessing through Atlanta. 
And, and then we get uh, on 640, I think it is. Is that what it is? I think. And, and we're going around Atlanta, and we're coming down the other side, and all of a sudden, stand still. Just inching along. And I was like, this is not what I asked for. And um, I, I was in the left lane because I like to go extra slow sometimes. I was in the left lane, and, uh, and, and we were, I was going as fast as the ones in the right lane because we were all moving just real slow. And, and Jessica's sleeping, her parents are sleeping, and, and I come up and I see the sign that says express lane to I-75 South. Now we're on, we're on 640, and I'm like, express lane. I like express. I like the sound of express. That's how I drive. And to I-75 South, that's where I want to go. So I'm getting closer, and I'm finally like, we're not going very fast. So I'm having this long time to process this. Finally, I say, hey, Cliff. You know, yeah. I said, is the express lane for anybody? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Which I didn't know. I just thought maybe he was tired and wanted to go back to sleep and leave him alone. You know, so he's like, yeah, go ahead. So I was like, all right. So I took it, and Jessica's now awake going, we're on the express line. And it was, I'm going to tell you, it was wide open. And, and from the time I saw it, which it wasn't that far, there was not one other person who took that exit. So I took it. So Jessica immediately gets out her phone, and she's Googling express lane in Atlanta. What does it mean? And it's, it's just simply that when they have, uh, if they have a, a, a traffic situation, like a wreck, or if they have construction, or if it's, uh, they have it set up where like in the morning when everybody's coming into Atlanta, they open up the express lane going one way. And then in the evening when everybody's going out of Atlanta, they open the express. It's just basically to help the flow of traffic. It gives them an extra couple lanes for different things. Well, there was a construction in our lane, and so they had opened up the expressway for us. So as soon as she told me that, I, I hit my text of Allison and voice thing. And I said, Allison, get in the left lane and take the ex- express lane to uh, 75 South. And uh, she goes, a little bit later, she texts me and was like, we did that. Is this legal? <laughs> she said, are we going to get in trouble for it? And she was convinced that she was going to get pulled over at any time and get ticketed or arrested or getting in trouble for taking the express lane. And I was finally like, no, listen, this is, this is what it's for. Um, but see, here's the thing, is that I don't know if she saw, did you ever see anybody get on before you or after you? No. So many of those cars had the same access that we had, but they were stuck. Would have taken a half hour, 45 minutes longer. They were stuck because they didn't know what they had. They weren't going anywhere because they didn't know what they had. And we got, I mean, we got around it. We didn't run into another slowdown like that the rest of the way down there. And I just, and the Holy Spirit started showing me, saying, that's where the church is. The church doesn't understand the authority they have. And so they're stuck. They're stuck in sickness. They're stuck in poverty. They're stuck in, in, in all the negative things that the enemy likes to throw at, at them. And they don't know what, they don't, they don't know what to do. They've begged him about as much as they could beg him. They've had I don't know how many different prayer groups trying to get them to do something. They're trying to trying to get something. You know, you, you, if you get in a traffic jam, what's the logical thing to do? Just honk your horn, right? Because maybe that'll get things moving. <laughs> mer, mer, get on. Come on, you could have moved up six feet. Instead, you're sitting there. Uh, uh. I ain't doing nothing, but that's what the church has been doing for year upon year upon year, trying to get God to do something. And God is busy saying, listen, I have done everything I know to do. If you will just step out in me and operate the way I created you, operate and live in the authority that I've already given to you, beloved, you you will go past where everybody else is standing still. And And it almost might make you feel like you're breaking the law. Because you're going to see some success. I still remember that one time down in Texas where Jessica had a, had a girl 
it was a friend of a girl that you worked with, right, who got sick. And she got real sick. And they had, they had you think they had called in the family because they were not anticipating. She was getting worse quick. And I'd prayed, but I kind of prayed like, you know, Lord, just bless them, you know. And it was a Wednesday night service or Tuesday, Thursday night service we had down there. It was a Thursday night service, and I'm standing there in praise and worship. And all of a sudden, this thing hit me like, um, it just, I mean, like a Mack truck. And I was like, I need to do this. And so I just, I mean, nobody knew the girl, but I was like, in Jesus' name right now, I speak uh, over her. I, I pronounce healing. And I, do you, I'm sure you remember me saying this because I said, I don't even know if I can do this or not. It's kind of like when I took off the expressway. I don't know, but I, I was like, I don't know if I can do this or not, but this is what I feel like I'm supposed to do. And I said, I curse Every word that has been spoken over her in that room, every word must fail in that room. And the only word that will, that will manifest is this word that says that she will live and not die. She, and and I, I spoke, I mean, it hit me with the unction. I spoke it with authority. And the next morning she gets a call from a friend going, we don't know what happened, but she's wide awake today and she's doing fine and she's going to be uh, discharged tomorrow. But see, how many people did she have praying for? They called us because they just wanted us to pray for. It's just let's get numbers up. Let's, let's see if we can gang up on God. It's kind of like your kids saying, well, if we can get all of us and, and ask mom and dad for it, surely they'll have to do it, right? I'm grateful that I'm not God because it's not, my, it's not up to me who goes into heaven. He's a just judge. But I'm thankful I'm not God because I don't have to. I would get really annoyed with people who kept asking me for stuff I'd already given them. All right, let us. We, I'm, I'm, I got to throw all those words, didn't I? So we have got to learn that what God is wanting us to do is more of making a demand on what he's already given to us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, I just want to throw this one in here in, in reference to what I just said. Um, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. It says, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. All right, all right, all right. All right. Remember John fourteen twelve, where it says, Though the, they that believe on me, Right? Um, and then here it says, uh, t- the God of this world has blinded the minds of them to believe not. If you're not believing what the Word of God says, then, you're, then He's blinding you, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And what happens if that shines onto you? You'll start living like it. You'll start living with the authority that God said you could have. And so the enemy likes to blind you. He likes to put people in your, in your path. I, I will guarantee you that, that, that you'll, you'll come across somebody this week that will try to shortchange uh, what I, what, what, what's been preached here today. Oh, please, you think you have authority? You have, I don't think I do. If this was, beloved, if this was just about the way I think, I wouldn't preach it. Listen, if, if, if I honestly believed God wanted us sick and God wanted us poor and God wanted us defeated, if I really honestly believed that, beloved, I would preach it. It would come out of my mouth. I would be faithful to the God that I got it from. But I legitimately believe with all my heart, with everything that I have, is that God wants us healthy, God wants us whole, God wants us victorious, God wants us strong, God wants us wealthy, God wants us to walk in the authority and to tell the devil exactly where he can stick it. Amen. Goodness gracious, where do I go from here? Go to Matthew. 
uh, another conversation that I wrote down was in our condo, and I have no idea. I have no idea the uh, the context of the of the conversation. Um, I just was sitting in our bedroom, just chilling in the room, in the chair, and I heard Jessica talking to her mom in the hallway. And the conversation, I wrote it down because it struck me, and you can tell what I was meditating on. But her her mom, her, just her mom said this again. Context, I don't know. I asked Jessica if she remembered the context. She didn't. But she said, I saw that shower head and thought it didn't work until I saw the kids use it, and then I knew it worked. Do you know, the, do you know why she would have seen one of you guys use that other shower head? I don't know. They had, they, had, they had the big, round, fat one that's kind of the rain shower one, and then they had one that came off uh, that you could take off, but it was the, the more powerful one. And, um, and so when you got in, you turned on the shower, one of them was on. And so if you didn't know how it worked, you just used that one. But they had a little button up above there that you could hit, and it would go on to the other one. Well, she didn't know how it worked. And she said she didn't listen here. She didn't know how it worked until she saw somebody else use it. And when she saw somebody else use it, she knew it worked. Beloved, there's a whole lot of people that want to argue the authority of the Christian. They want to argue the healing of the Christian. They want to argue the prosperity of the Christian. They just need to see somebody who will turn it on. Somebody who will walk in it. In, in Matthew chapter 8 is, is a story. I, I, again, I think we're so familiar with this story. Um, but it says, let's start reading verse 5. It says, And when Jesus had entered in Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I'll come and heal him. All right, all right. Now, now the first, first thing I want to bring out here is a centurion is not a Jew. He was a Roman dude. So he was a Gentile. And Jesus didn't say, well, let me get you saved first. Let me get you converted over to Judaism before I go. The centurion came to him and just simply asked him for a healing. And Jesus said, okay. Again, this guy, I think I dealt with it last week, is that we've got to get out of that mentality that, well, we don't know if it's God's desire if he wants to heal the sinner. He did. He Jesus did it. Je- Jesus did it. It wasn't, it wasn't like uh, a rebellious disciple going, I'm going to do what I'm, I'm a hooligan. I'm going to heal whoever I want to heal. This was Jesus who said, no, I, this is the way I work. If you're sick, I'll heal you. And so, so the guy, so he said, okay, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy. That you should even come under my roof. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Now we've spent many hours talking about that one, right? Speak the word only. That's faith. Uh, if, if all you got is the word of God, you can't see anything, you don't know anything, but you got the word of God, that's enough. But, but, but I want to go beyond that because he said, For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say unto this man, go, and he goeth, to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And Jesus heard it and was marveled. He was astonished and said unto them that followed, see this man's faith? See what he just said? I've not seen that kind of faith, not even in all of Israel. This was the one thing that that, that Jesus had been trying to get across to his disciples since they've been following him, and they weren't getting it. And a heathen comes up to him and says, Look, I don't need you to come under my roof. I know authority. And I know how it works for me. Therefore, I know how it works for you. So all you need to do is say for that spirit to leave him, and that spirit will leave him. And so, of course, we know Jesus said, All right. You know, that spirit be gone, and spirit was gone that same hour. 
But that phrase, that, that, that verse in there where it says, um, I am a man under authority, and I have men under me. This is verse 9. I am a man under authority, and I have men that are under me. I know how authority works. I understand that. And I understand as a man who's got men under me that I've got to use that authority based on who I am. That if I don't use that authority, it's not going to get done. So knowing who I am and there are things that are... See, here's our problem. Is that we look at angels as being just a little bit above us. That, that they're there to order us around. No. We were created a little lower than Elohim, God himself. Angels were not created in God's image. We were. We were created to create. Angels are not. Angels are created to obey the, word, the voice of the word of God. Or to obey those that operate in authority. Right? So, so when we don't think that we're, uh, we don't know what's underneath us, we don't know that, our, that angels have been given to us for us to send and to tell them to do something, that we don't understand that demonic activity, the devil is underneath us. Listen, the devil is not just underneath us. He's not just lower than us. He's under our feet. But if you keep worrying, I don't want to say that because if I say that, the devil might get mad at me. And if the devil gets mad at me, you know, Lord, the devil doesn't have that authority. The only thing the devil can do is where you open up to him and allow him in to do. And so this man, this centurion, understood authority and understood that when I'm in authority, there are people, there are things underneath me. And then notice what he says. He said, I tell some of them to go. And they go. Simply because of my words. I tell others to come. And they come. Simply because of what I said. I tell others to do this. And they do it. Simply because of my authority. I don't have to, I don't have to go, notice this. He says, I'm a man under authority. So there's someone above me, right? And then there's men underneath me. And I don't go to those men and say, hey, Bob told you to do this. And they do it. Hey, Bob told you to go do that. You need to go do it. He said, I tell them, based on the authority that I have, what to do. And they must obey me. Listen, yes, we have authority in the name by the blood of Jesus. I get that. I understand that. But you can simply sit there and say, devil, get your hands off my stuff. And the devil has no choice. Get your hands off my body. Get your hands off my family. And you don't have to... Yes, you could say in the name of Jesus, that's fine. That's where our authority comes from. But God the Father said, I have given you all authority. All right. Marvel, okay, Centurion did that. Um... Some okay, go go to James four, because some of you go, some of you might be going. And I don't know about this business, Ed. I think you misunderstand what they're saying there. Well, again, how about in the mouth of two or three witnesses? How about if we find some stuff in Scripture where Jesus says, "Come," or Jesus told us to, to tell them to go, and they go. Tells us to come, they come, and tell us to do this, and they do that. How about if we just found some mouth of two or three witnesses that? What, this, what Jesus was trying to get across to us here 
Maybe, maybe we get some... Well, James 4, verse 7. Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Ask God to resist the devil for you. Who resists the devil? You tell him to go. Isn't that what resisting is? You go. And he goes. He doesn't have a right to talk to you about it. He doesn't have a right to get a parting shot in and say, well, yeah, you might die with that on your body. No, he doesn't have a right to that. When you resist the devil, he must flee. He will flee. That's that, that's that authority. How about go over to Matthew chapter 16? I think this is also Matthew 18. As a matter of fact, I think I have it written down there too. Yeah, Matthew 18, 18. We're just going to do Matthew 16, 19. Who? <laughs> Matthew 16, verse 19, it says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So God's giving us access. Oh, goodness gracious. There's several of you in this room. Well, I'll just pick on Sister Beulah. Because there's a couple mornings where I decide to get over here a little, not, not often, but I'll get over here maybe a little bit earlier and I'll get out to unlock the door and I'm like, why is this door unlocked? And I'll open it up, I'm like, why are these lights on? What's going on? Now I've come to figure it out. And I'll say, Sister Beulah? Yes, Pastor, I'm back here. And, but you know what? If she wants to come over and clean the church, she ha- doesn't have to come and ask me to, for access. She has the key. And God has given us the key. So we can come boldly before his throne of grace. So we can come boldly in whatever heaven has for us, we can possess. He says, behold, I have given you the keys of the kingdom. And then notice what he says here. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. What, what, what fits inside whatsoever? Whatsoever. Whatever. Whatever. If you bind something or tell something to go on earth, all of heaven, the, the place that you've been given the keys to, the kingdom of heaven, all of heaven gets behind you to chase that thing away. There was a, a a story I heard. I think it was Woody Woodson, but it could have been someone else, about some guys who went down to Mardi Gras uh, to to witness. And I uh, mustache. All right, they went down to Mardi Gras uh, to witness. And when they got down there, they were uh, they were they're like, let's go down to the gangs. So they went down to the roughest part and went up to a gang and and uh, the gang. Um, was like, uh, gonna, okay, hey, we're going to get you, you know. And, and they came up and they were, they were ready. They were starting to get a little agitated towards them and getting angry at them. These guys are trying to love on them and they're, try, and they're getting angry. And all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden, the, 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 the boys are sitting there and the gang just looks behind them, kind of letting them look at them. And they get this fear pierced in their eyes. And they're like, all right. And they just turn around and ran away. Well, the boys turned around and they saw police officers coming. So they thought, oh, they saw the cops coming. Well, the, the police officer came and, and he, they questioned the boys and they said, were are you guys okay? Yeah. What were you doing? We were just witnessing to, these, to this gang and stuff like that. And they said, okay, where's the third guy at? The guy that was right behind you. They go, no, it was just us two. It was just us. We were said, no, when I turned that corner, there was definitely three of you. There were you two and there's a big guy behind you. Where's that guy at? And I, there was no third guy. Well, we know who the third guy was, right? But that's, that's what, 
When you know your authority, you step into situations and you're backed by all that heaven heaven has. Amen? The the, the enemy can't come against you because you are backed by everything the enemy has. And so whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. It's going to be done. And whatever you loose on earth is going to be loosed in heaven. So when you tell the enemy to stop, He's got to stop. When you, tell it, when you tell healing to come, it's got to come. When you tell money to come, it's got to come. Now, again, a lot of people want to fight some of this stuff because they're like, you, so you're saying we can just demand anything that we want? Anything the Word of God says you can have or has been given to you. The one thing that will defeat your purpose really quick is selfishness. And we're not going to get into that. But I'm not, I, well, I, think I, I know I got this coming up here in a little bit. So we're not talking about the fact that, oh, I just want a big car, so I'm going to demand a big car. Do you understand when Jesus came and he said, here's what I'm doing. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm healing the brokenhearted. I'm binding up those that are bruised. I'm, I'm doing all that, right? And, and then he said, I'm giving money to the poor. What did he say about the poor? Well, he said it, but but in in Luke 4, I I guess I should have. What did he say he's doing with the poor? He's preaching the good, good news to the poor. He's teaching them. So you can't demand increase financially where there's no seed. Where there, you know, all right. Just point of inference. So I'm not, I'm not saying that you can just go around just demanding, I want that house. I want that. No, you, you again, don't be, all right. I'll talk about that later. But he said, go. They went. He said, come. They came. Go to one more. Go, uh, did, I, did I hit both of those? Yeah. Go to Joshua chapter 1. So when you tell something to stop, then you have all of heaven's forces behind you to stop it. When you tell something to come, you have all of heaven's forces behind you to bring it. What you allow, heaven will allow. What you stop, heaven will stop. Why? Because you have been given the authority. Joshua chapter 1. Now again, we know Moses. Let's go to verse 2. Let's just start verse 2. Joshua 1, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land that I have given you. You know what I'm after. The land? I've given it to you. It's their land. Hold on to that land. What was keeping them from enjoying the land? It's just them. Because this is every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you. And then he sets the parameters in verse 4. And then verse 5 says, there's not a man that can stand against you. Because when you, the only thing limited in you is what you take is where you step on, is where you go, is what you do. You don't have to ask me. You don't have to ask me, Lord, will you please give me this land? I've already given it to you. Quit asking and start stepping. Quit asking and start walking. Quit asking and start speaking. All right. So, again, and then he says, and that's where in verse 6 he starts with the obstinate, hard-headed obstinate. Don't don't let people talk you out of this. All right. Let me hit this one more. One more, and then uh, halfway through this I'll tell Jessica to go to the piano. Mark chapter 11. I'll just hit this, and then we'll, I want to get to this point because this is going to be our springboard into next week. Are are you you understanding what I'm saying here? 
We need to change the way we think about prayer. We need to change the way we think about healing and even prosperity. If we've got seed in the ground, then we, we can expect seed to rise up. We, we, don't, we don't serve God because he's going to make us rich. We serve God because we love him. But when we obey him and we, and we operate in what he's given us, then, then all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. And again, we can sit around and wait for something to happen or we can start taking ground. Amen. But Mark chapter 11, verse 12, uh, Jesus is leaving Bethany where he had been staying to go into Jerusalem. And on the morrow, verse 12, they were come from Bethany. He was hungry. As they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs were not yet. Now, I know some of y'all are going, why did Jesus get mad if it wasn't time for the figs and he wanted a fig? Is he that, you know, come on, it wasn't fig. Just relax. I don't get mad at the apple tree in December because there ain't no apples on it. So, you know. Um, just simply, and the, uh, the best I've ever heard it explained is that in, when it wasn't time, there were these little uh, figs that, were, that grew on there that were not, they were not big figs, but they were good enough where they could pick them off and eat them and they, they would uh, satisfy your hunger. And so that's what he was looking for. He was just looking for these little things. But when he, go, when he showed up to it, it looked like they should have had those little figs on there, but they weren't on there. Um, and so Jesus, now why did Jesus do this? Was he just that angry? No, he's trying to show something. Jesus didn't do anything just by chance. He was trying to make an illustration out of it. And, uh, and so Jesus answered and said, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. I think it's, again, don't, disciples heard it. Okay, well, he said it loud. He said it forcefully. He said it with authority. And he said it clear. I'm sure they thought, well, okay. Whatever. Is he just mad? Is he just flippant? Is he, are these just idle words? Are they just empty words? You know, a lot of us would be going, well, I hope you go out of business. And I hope you, you don't have any hamburgers. You, uh, I, don't, I don't hope you go out of business. You know, we just throw it around because we got ticked off. But Jesus had authority and he knew his authority. And he was wanting to show these guys something. And so there was no figs. And so he said, no more. Nobody's going to eat from you forevermore. And... Uh, so they went in to Jerusalem, had an eventful day. I think Jesus turned over the temple, the tables, all kind of stuff. They came out that day. Nothing's mentioned of the tree. They came back to go back to Bethany and to stay. So, so apparently, really nothing had happened. Jesus didn't mention it. The disciples didn't mention it. Nobody mentioned it. They, uh, you know, maybe the disciples walked by and said, bad tree, bad tree. Um, but then in verse 20, and in the morning, they were going back into Jerusalem. And as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And Jesus started his uh, sermon on, which again, go to 23. I go to 20 points in 24, where it says, this is a lesson, remember, on faith? And he says, therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire. Does anybody know what that word desire means? I tell you. Whatsoever things you demand. Jesus is telling them here. That what I spoke, I don't, I don't have idle words. And we're going to get into this next week. I don't have idle words. I don't have words that sometimes mean something and sometimes don't mean something. I don't know if I've told you this story um, in, in this series or not. But several years back, Jesse, you want to come to piano? Okay, thank you. Uh, several years back when Allison was younger, I'm picking on her a lot today. But when, she was, when she was younger, I would often... Uh, pick on her, and I know that it's hard to believe, but sometimes I'd pick on her like she was in trouble. 
and I would get after her, and I'd say, you shouldn't, you know, and then I'd just be, I'm just kidding. And so, so there's a couple different times where she, would, she was actually in trouble for something. And I would say, Allison Marie, because that's how you know you're in trouble. And I would tell her what she, what she did wrong. And she would just look at me and smile and start giggling. And I'm like, no, Allison, you're in trouble. You need to just stop that. Don't do that anymore. And she'd just giggle harder. And I'm like, honey. And of course, she's giggling. So it was kind of, even though I was upset, I'd have this little smile on my face. So she thought I was kidding. And so she would giggle more. And I'd look at Jessica. I said, will you please help her understand I'm being serious? And Jessica's like, listen, I can't do nothing. And I'd be like, no, Allison, listen, you're in trouble. You can't do this. And she'd giggle more. I th- it, she, maybe, she maybe was doing it on purpose. But see, the times that I had played around with the words I said made the time that I needed to get a point across to her a lot harder. And so if you're busy going around saying stuff like things like I'm scared to death or just what, what, what not, you know, we're just, maybe you're talking about your sickness. You're talking about how broke you are. You're talking about how, well, you know, you get, you, you, you get older and, and your body starts breaking down. You, you just, you just say things out. When, when did you really mean business? Which words that you come out with? Jesus had none of those. He had no idle words. He didn't say things just to say, just to fill up the air. He said things only that he heard his father say. It doesn't mean we can't have conversations. But watch your conversations. Don't let people sink you into this COVID thing. You just, it's a horrible thing. And, and you just never know when your number is going to be called up. And you never know when that is. Oh, I, I know. Don't be sucked into that. Those are idle words. You better hope that in a day or two, you don't have to speak against COVID. Because you just said two days before that, oh, yeah, it's a horrible thing. It's, it's, it, you don't know when your number's up. You just said it a couple of days ago. Which one do you want them to believe? You know, we're getting, again, I keep saying we're going to get more into that. But believe it, beloved, Jesus didn't go around mixing stuff. He only spoke what his father said. He only spoke according to the word of God. He didn't, he didn't call anything exactly what he believed it was. And therefore, when he cursed a fig tree, you understand he didn't just keep cursing it. He wouldn't, he, he would not, I think one of the gospels says he wouldn't even notice it except his disciples called his attention to it. He was walking in, he knew it was dead. He wasn't, he didn't look, oh, maybe, hopefully it's not too late. Maybe it's produced fruit now. He knew it was dead. That night from Jerusalem back to Bethany, he knew it was dead. It didn't look dead. Beloved, fill your mouth. Know who you are. Jesus knew who he was. Know who you are. And we'll, again, we'll get more into it next week. Fill your mouth with the word. Don't let friends, don't let family, don't let people around you uh, get you into conversations where you fill your mouth with natural stuff. Speak the word only, and your situation will change. The things that you tell, say to come will come. The things that you say to go will go. You tell something to be done, and it'll be done. But speak the word only. Let's stand together. How are you? Are you are we getting this? Again, what I, I believe that this is one of those messages that you need to not, not just, oh, Pastor, that was good. And, and don't think about it again until next week. 
You need to take this home and feed on it. I would highly suggest the second that the second it gets online this week, that at least once or twice, you just keep, if you've written down scriptures, go over scriptures to where the Holy Spirit is continuing to reveal things to you. Because again, if you just get this picture of a six lane highway, every lane is backed up for half a mile, mile, more, and we're just driving 65, 75. And we're just sailing past that because we're not stuck in the same thing everybody else is because we're using something God's given us. If you see that picture, you begin understanding it's time for us to fly. We run through troops, leap over walls. We don't get stuck in traffic. Amen. What are we seeing? All my life. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good.